So we can start with a panel on the four technical dimensions of the Internet. Oscar Robles, Alejandro Adamovich, Christine Hoopers, Ariel Grazer. Could you please come up? While we wait, I would like to encourage to you to participate and interact with through the social media. Here we have the frame where you can take pictures and publish these in the social media with the hashtag LACNIC37 and also share information that you think might be relevant on this event over the coming days. So while we wait for the rest of the panel to come. I'm going to explain how participation will be organized. Questions will be made with a microphone for those participants who are here. You will please mention your name and the organization you represent. Remember that you can write your questions in the Q&A panel. This is for the remote participants. So now we're all here. Let us start with a panel, a journey across the four technical dimensions of the Internet, which will be l moderated by Oscar uh, Robles. Alejandro Adamovich, who is the Regional Director of Technology and Strategy in Latin America, and Alvaro Retana, Vice President of Strategies and Technologies in Future Technologies in the room. We have Christine Hoopers, General Manager in NICVR, and Ariel Grazer, Director of LAC-IX. So now, over to you, Oscar. Thank you, Sandra. So thank you very much. It is a real pleasure to see you here. It is a pleasure to be with you once again and to have these meetings where we can see, uh, speak face to face. Although we tried to maintain these events during the pandemic, it wasn't the same. So those of you who are in the back, there is a lot of room here in the front of the conference room. So now we will be speaking about the technical dimensions of the internet. Constantly internet has been attacked in the figurative sense and in the real sense, in the figurative sense, through regulations, expensive regulations that have an impact in the operation of the Internet or also a negative effect in the sense of how this network has been defined. And this is a bit surprising because there might be excuses for implementing some regulations. It is therefore important that those of us who live from the Internet and those of us who know how Internet was designed can defend this way of operating, of operating when attacks such as these occur. This can be expensive types of regulations or the greediness of some kind of organizations or other complex things. So today we have with us a panel. We have four excellent professionals with us who will help us through this journey, through these four dimensions. They allow us to see which are those dimensions and what, what are those aspects that we have to pay attention to when these regulations occur or these attacks to the Internet. They were already introduced, so now I will give you, we'll start with Christine Hoopers. Christine Hoopers is general manager at the CERT BR. In person is Ariel Grace with us, who is a chair of the Internet Chamber of Argentina, Cabasa. Sandra, as Sandra is saying, we have Alvaro Retana, who is the VP on strategy and technology of future networks and future waste technologies. And we also have Alejandro Aramovich, who is a regional technology and strategic engagement director 
for Latin America and GSMA. So thank you very much to you for joining us today. Let us start then to speak about these topics. As we're saying, Internet is being attacked constantly in the figurative and in the real sense. Many attacks are done to its infrastructure, to its security, and we have seen how the Internet has been resilient to all these attacks in many ways. But much has been said about the fact that the security considerations were not established in the original design of the Internet. So in that sense, we're going to ask Christine, to what extent are we still dealing today with issues resulting from not having had those security considerations? Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I am very happy to be participating in this event. I have attended since event number two. And I think that this comment that you made about the importance of uh, what uh, accompanies the Internet, the growth of the Internet, and how important it is to comment on what's been going on. The first thing that we can defend is that it wouldn't be possible to have too many security protocols there in uh, the early times of the Internet. It wouldn't have been possible because there was no uh, uh, encryption, uh, strong encryption, or even the development of software was very poor. There was not enough maturity or not enough development. So everything was quite experimental. So traveling in time, we have to remember that because in a certain way, there was no way we could have security as we understand it today. Uh, at the same time, there were also some decisions were made very naive. Uh, today, we uh, struggle a lot with security and uh, at the time, there were very few IP addresses, and even though IPv6 is not seen as a security problem today, the complexity of the transition techniques are adding uh, pro security problems, problems uh, to when you want to do the incident forensics. So that is something that the community present here might solve by using the IPv6 uh, and uh, developing, as uh, they said at the opening session, uh, the importance of using, uh, increasing our use of IPv6. I think that if we think of things that uh, are missing today, it might be good to have a stronger DNS, a more robust DNS. It's a protocol that uh, we also use a lot, and there are protocol problems. So uh, that uh, naive uh, protocol, when you live in a safe neighbor neighborhood, you, you have no idea of what a uh, dangerous uh, neighborhood uh, is. When we, at the beginning, when the internet was operated at the universities, we didn't see a need to have security. But until today, we our greatest um, uh, challenge is that today's generation, internet generation, uh, should have the same uh, will to innovate as uh, the 30 to 40 year old uh, generations and leaving our comfort zones. If everything is working, let's not touch it. That's what people think. But it's working, but it can still improve. This is something that we can apply in the present. Many of you work in the generation and development of protocols that make uh, uh, the internet uh, safer, more secure. Uh, HTTPS, a DNSSEC, a number of protocols that give us the possibility of having a more robust internet. But all these developments, if Christine, if you had had a chance to introduce any of those protocols from the inception, which of those would you have used, or what would you have done different? I know that uh, uh, encryption was not possible. Well, if we could go back to the past and, uh, and uh, have an idea of encryption 20 years earlier, in 1996, I, I think that a more secure DNS would have been very important if we had Without TLS, uh, it it would uh, be it would have been essential. But I think that many of the problems that we have today that have an impact not just in the uh, core of the internet. Many people may say that 
Well, it would be good to have our PKI, a more robust DNS, but having a more robust DNS would have made our life easier today to uh, fight against especially uh, financial attacks, botnet and uh, cache poisoning. So today I think that we would be doing a little better if we had implemented that earlier, but we would have had to go back 20 years earlier to convince people of do encryption. So it's important to defend all the ideas of the internet because part of the success is uh, precisely having simplicity. And the matter of fact that we are adopting and that any country could connect, if we had a lot of complexity at the beginning, if it had been very complex at the beginning, it wouldn't have been ex uh, adopted, probably. So in terms of just security, I, it would be DNS. Uh, I, I would go back to win, vent surf and I would tell him to add more security to IPs. Yes, yes, of course. Um, DNS is essential for the operations of the internet, but sometimes it is ignored. As it is very noble, very loyal, it works very quickly, and we ignore it once it's working. But we are not aware of the many risks, uh, potential risk, if you don't pay close attention to it. So now let's talk of the other dimension. How? Do you design a network to support technologies that will arise in 50 years or 30 or 40 years time? What can be done so that today we may understand the technological needs that we will have in such a long time? So to give you the perspective, let's talk, for instance, of the evolution of the mobile technologies, GCMA was created in 1987, uh, and 4G was created in 2005, and it became operational in 2007. So let's ask Alejandro Adamovich, since he's with us, to please tell us and uh, to make comments about the creation of mobile technologies so that we May, please tell us what helped in the design of the internet so that this very important uh, development of mobile networks could be uh, compatible with uh, the original design. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me. I'm very proud to participate GCMA in LACNECA 37. Unfortunately, I can't be with you today, obviously, on site, but my best regards from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And as Oscar said, I would like to give you a brief summary of the mobile networks and how mobile networks have gradually uh, been transformed and have fully adopted uh, from uh, the fourth generation on, have adopted the IP protocols. The history of um, well uh, of the mobile technology is almost a hundred years old, but the way we know it initially, the mobile technology started in 1973. The first commercial mobile network was launched in uh, 1979 in Japan, and in 1983, the first. Uh, mobile phone appeared, what we used to call the bricks that cost $4,000 and would uh, weigh two and a half kilos, and they were so-called uh, mobile phones at that time. In 1987, at the beginning of the commercial mobile uh, telephony, they um, based on a, a European guideline, uh, they saw the need to create a global standard, global service mobile. And that is the origin of what then happened in 1987. The foundation was February 1987 because it was then that they signed the first agreement for those standards in Europe with 15 members from 13 countries. The first call, the first SM call, was in 1991 in Finland, and that gave rise to the second generation. So from 1979 and 1991, all the mobile telephones were analogic, the 1G 
voice communication. That was what it was created for. And at the beginning of the 2G also showed the beginning of the digital mobile phones with the capacity to transfer data up to 64 kilobits per second. It was not such a poor performance as compared to the dial-up, but we but uh, it was not always possible to get, get that speed. So given the perspective that the internet in parallel is, that is that commercial internet uh, already had already started in the early 90s, in, 19, in 2001, they launched the first 3G standard, that is the first uh, 3G network in uh, Japan. They launched the first national 3G with two megabits per second, so the story had changed a lot. So, and uh, ever since uh, 2001, 2002, we've seen a constant growth of the deployment of devices with increasingly better capacities and smaller and smaller. In 20, 2002, they launched BlackBerry. I'm sure you remember it. In 2007, they launched the first iPhone, the first Android versions. And meanwhile, they started developing the 4G standard. The 4G standard between 2005 and 2007, they started with the first test. In 2009, the first uh, commercial launch that was in Norway. And curiously enough, uh, well, the good news is that 4G was also launched quite quickly in Latin America. It started in 2011 in Uruguay, then in Bolivia, 2013, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, Argentina, a bit later. And the 4G, the fourth generation, at least of those of us who come from the fixed and mobile world, 4G was the one that gave a satisfactory user experience for browsing and for videos, not just watching videos uh, or uh, movies on YouTube, but also interactive communications. And that is thanks to innovations in the network. And it's not by chance that the so-called 4G network is the first uh, technological IP network from its inception. Up to the third generation, they, they were circuit switching. So although you could uh, establish uh, channels, it was, uh, the, it was uh, switch uh, and not packets uh, transfer transport. So this was the first time. Of course, this meant a challenge because you have to ensure compatibility backwards. So the 4G network needs to be compatible with 2G and 3G. In Latin America, this is a significant percentage. In some countries, even up to 45% of the mobile clients still use 2G and 3G. So 4G also needs to be compatible with users that with other generations. And this is a challenge from the technological point of view. I could discuss it further, but I don't think this is uh, the moment. Very good. So we are speaking of 5G for several years. In 2018, they launched the first 5G network in the United States and in South Korea. And 5G is, does not mean another leap in speed as a 4G versus the third. 5G has several innovations. First of all, it's not just increasing velocities, but of course it is, but from 100 megabits per second of a good 4G network to standard uh, speeds of 1 megabit per second and with peaks of 10 megabits per second. But it has two characteristics that are that uh, it will, a uh, 5G network allows for up to 1 million devices per square kilometer. This was not possible until now. And on the other hand, uh, ultra uh, uh, reliability and latency, that is, errors less than 10 to the 8th and latencies under 1 millisecond. And this is very important for industrial apps, uh, telemedicine, those apps that require 1 millisecond latencies compatible with the 
the latency of uh, the human brain. That is what happens since we think of an action and we have our hand to do it. So it's very important at the time of uh, for uh, 5G uh, app application in the industry. Thank you, Alejandro, for this very interesting journey through the development of the mobile technologies. So you may have heard that it was in parallel. It was not a process that first they developed the internet and then the mobile networks, but they they happened at the same time and they converged at the end of their paths. So all the process is very interesting. Now, in your view, Alejandro, what part of that uh, original design of the internet made it easier to have such a convergence, which do you consider is the key element for these two technologies to be compatible? Well, of course, as the survey on the technical um, uh, well, as Mason says in its uh, studies, the mobile network benefits of the conception of the IP network and what they share in common, the native IP networks, the internet basically, and the mobile network that gradually learned uh, through the different generations adapted and, uh, in terms of scalability. You know the internet better than uh, myself and mobile networks today there are over than 5 billion mobile clients and 15 billion of data subscriptions so it's a network with a traffic that growth at over 40 to 50 percent annually globally in some countries especially in Latin America and in some African countries the traffic continues to duplicate on an annual basis there are practically no networks that can support this flexibility. The mobile networks have been offering internet since its second generation, but the fourth generation is the first one that provides a full user experience. And it's not just by chance that this flexibility is provided by the entire use in terms of the IP architecture the IP architecture, so mobile networks have learned about the success of the internet and incorporated these natively. In the case of datability, this has to do with an element that I think is very important. Many of the innovations, many of the advances in terms of the services offered by mobile networks is driven by the devices launching of the iPhone in 1997, the first Android uh, versions with five-inch screens, with gaming, with all types of challenges for the networks, has really sped up this innovation. And the great proof, the great uh, evidence was as from 2020 with the traffic increase resulting from the pandemic, of course, the amount of traffic has increased incredibly. Mobile networks, 50% within two to three weeks. And really, they were put to the test. Resilience was put to the test. And we haven't had reports on problems. Although the mobile networks, to increase their capacity, face many challenges. You don't only have to install antennas and ask for authorizations from the municipalities, but mobile networks also depends on the radioelectric spectrum, as if it were oxygen. If you don't have radioelectric spectrum, spectrum, you don't have mobile capacity. And very often, these processes take many years. You might have heard of the 5G calls for bids and the values, the economic value this involves. So the deployment of the capacity, the creation of capacity for a mobile network is really a challenge for operators. So I would say, to summarize this part of the reflection we are making, is that what IP technology has incorporated to the mobile technologies has provided this flexibility and this true convergence. This is the very first time, particularly with the fifth generation, that we're going to see a real convergence in infrastructures. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you in a while. You referred to scalability. 
there is no technology that has not evidenced this scalability as the internet. We have billions and billions of devices connected to the internet, and there is no perspective of such this becoming saturated. But more recently, we saw this capacity of scalability in the network through its installed infrastructure during the pandemic. We saw how providers showed increase in traffic of service and servicing by 50 percent. How do the internet operators, the access operators, how do they go about having this capacity available and the flexibility to increase their operations? Your microphone, Ariel. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Congratulations on the 20th anniversary. It is always a pleasure to be at the at LACNIC's events. Now, I will make sort of a self-reference in your answer, but I think this happened to all the operators. When the pandemic came to Argentina on March 20th, we were all sent home. We were locked down. Internet traffic during that week increased 45%. I became a star, a rock star, as chair of the Argentine Chamber of the Internet. All the radios, all the television channels called me and said, will Internet be able to respond to this? Is the Internet prepared to really make this possible with everyone at home? So one radio after another, one television company after the other were asking the same question, and my answer is, we are ready for an increase because we conceived our networks five years ahead of time, and we developed the networks based on planning. And we plan these for the peak and not for the valley. So this way in which operators build our networks, I am an ISP, and I build my network for the peak period. So the adjustment, the modification that we saw in the graph reflecting the traffic, uh, internet traffic at least in Argentina, but I think this happened in other places as well. It looks like a Gauss graph with a maximum peak at 6 p.m. and a valley that is quite clear from 5 in the morning until 8. Now, during the lockdown and during the pandemic, we had a small peak at 11 in the morning when the kids started remote schooling. But 45% of the peak, nothing happened during the 45, during the peak. Operators continue having incidents in the network as we have always had. It crashes or there is a storm and something happened to a fiber or to a tower, but the network was ready. And I never had any doubts in the sense that the large majority of the operators, at least in Argentina, the ones we knew, were ready for that increase, precisely because we plan for the peak periods and not for the valley. And this is something that is constant throughout the industry, also speaking with other colleagues from Latin America and from other countries. And the same happened to all of us. So after the first two weeks, traffic sort of dropped a bit and was at a 35% increase following the f initial 50% increase. And after that, it increased once again. It increased the 50% that increases. It increases every year at least in Cavasi, where we somehow measure the traffic exchange between networks, not within each network and not each operator, because we're not allowed to and because we don't wish to do so. But some of us who published our information traffic continued with the same growth as usual, but 35% higher. Great. 
So you were saying that you build for the peak periods, you design for the peak periods, and not for the valley. So any other industry that would have that philosophy, that rationale for building capacity would collapse. So having that idle capacity during most of the time is a considerable effort. And sort of stepping aside from the design of the internet, how does this industry manage to maintain that capacity most of the time and that this remains profitable? That is a complex question because internet traffic, which is what we manage somehow, changes constantly. We, at Kawase, we conducted measurements showing that between 6 p.m. and 11 p.m., 98.2% of the traffic we had was video. This is a type of traffic that did not exist five years ago. It didn't even affect the statistics. It wasn't, there was no volume in that sense. And today the CDNs, and even more than the CDNs, the content providers, entertainment that do video streaming, generate the need of a change in the strategy as to how we negotiate looking for that content and where that content is hosted, because this has to do with the business equation, which was your question. So the majority of the ISPs, at least in Latin America, are worried about finding the content and hosting these in our own network so that the business is profitable. That is a challenge we have today in the negotiations we have with these big companies who are merging and are the owners of that 98% of the videos that go through our networks. So this is a full-time job. This is uh, something we work on on a daily basis to figure out how we can, can we best manage traffic and to remain profitable. If we are not profitable, we cannot sustain, maintain the networks, and if an ISP. And in fact, some time ago, I gave a talk that had to do with this topic, and I called it the possible death of the death of the internet, of the neutrality of the internet. But if the equation of having to look for content is greater than maintaining the network, we do have a problem in the design. You mentioned today and going over to Alvaro now, who is with us remotely. Ariel mentioned a while ago that 95% of the traffic was video traffic, but internet was born as uh, the exchange of packets for text, but internet seems not to care what we do because it can work sending text, exchanging uh, files, simple messages to what we have today, which is any amount of applications that send videos, send voice, send text, send large files, a combination of data that is quite interesting. But it has also had this capacity, this plasticity, so that 90% of the videos of the internet at night is videos, but cached video, video that is stored in the form of movies. But during the day, it was video that could not be stored, that it could not be cached. And internet behaved differently during the night hours and the morning hours. And transit capacities was different in those times of day. So allow me to ask Alvaro the following. How do you design a network to have this capacity to adapt to the technologies that you might have today or in five, 50 years' time, or five years' time. Good morning. Greetings to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. As Oscar said earlier, I'm a bit jealous of not being able to be in Colombia this week. I apologize for not having been able to travel this week. Yes. the. Internet does not care what happens. 
the philosophy of when designing the network, but also designing the network protocols as something we owe to the pioneers of the internet, uh, Vint Cerf and Khan, who designed the basic protocols, the basic protocols that were essential for building the internet. So that is where the adaptability and scalability come from, the flexibility. There are many design principles that have been developed and that have evolved over the years. This has been like a philosophy in the design. But this is not only for the design of the networks, but also in the design of the protocols for the network. So we see the design of the layers, of the tiers. You have protocols in the different levels that have standard interfaces so that others can benefit from these services in order to be able to see that design. At the core of which you have the IP, there is a lot of transport, and there are many, many applications above this because we have these standard interfaces. The same with the, we see in network design, where we have a clear hierarchy with different uh, features and different places in the network. So when uh, the traffic grows, you can distribute uh, the features in the network and you can distribute the traffic and we can absorb and grow even faster. This is also the concept of the network of network network, uh, that is the internet is connection of many networks, although we have standard protocols. So uh, there are networks that are developed for various purpose, uh, purposes. There are autonomous systems that have independent functions using even independent protocols and different protocols where we can isolate functions and flaws, we can add traffic and give different uh, uh, services. So this design principle helps us grow, increase our flexibility, etc. And of course, we have the principle of end-to-end -end visibility, end-to-end -end visibility of connections in the internet from my computer to any server I connect to. This makes it it's possible to build apps that may consider all the benefits of the rest of the layers. And it is very important to know, to have to go a step ahead and to think how the apps will be designed or what types of apps we will see, or we will use. So the app developers may be, will be able to use these uh, construction blocks as if it were a Lego and uh, where we build and we can uh, develop with our own functionalities, as you said, in finances or less sophisticated things, even text exchange. But it continues to be. Uh, although uh, a text exchange. So that makes it possible. Well, the protocols are built in stack so we can explore that. Um, so in the slides, in the apps, uh, any need that we may have industrial, uh, personal, commercial, and we can build apps and we can explore and we can think what would happen if I did this or that? How can I develop my protocol on this layer, on these open layers of the protocols distributed, distributed that we have designed in the internet? So this is an evolution and a revolution where we give steps in the infrastructure as it evolves and the apps that give faster steps and longer strides. Thank you, Alvaro. You Now that you mentioned the layer design and uh, the net, uh, network of the internet works, there was a presentation in uh, the Internet Week in El Salvador where they uh, established the analogy between the um, internet and uh, the surprise uh, toys that they gave out in McDonald's that is 
built for a very specific uh, purpose and it uh, meets only that role. But Lego can give you, um, permits you to be uh, creative for future use and have the flexibility to adapt to new technologies. So speaking of new technologies, what are the characteristics that the Internet of the future should have to last an, uh, 50 years more, at least the next generation? Now, you are thinking of that. What are the characteristics that you consider that that network should have? Well, as you said, I think that this is an evolution and revolution. What I mean is that it is clear that the Internet has evolved and it's grown steadily in the last 40 to 50 years. And we even have protocols that were originally designed and are still used. IPv4, I, although we have IPv4, the TNS, the TCP, the BGP is one of the newest, but it's already 30 years old. So those protocols will continue to evolve and to grow. I think that there will be a great uh, revolution in terms of apps, because there are apps that we still don't know that will exist. So we have needs that we don't have not, uh, there are needs that have not been met. So we, we have to think of what are the kinds of things that we want for the future, what kind of networks do we uh, want for the future. So if, um, if uh, we have needs for 10 years and building these networks, well, we have to start building networks to get, provide support for future um, uh, apps. So the good thing is that we'll build these Legos and we have changes in transportation. Uh, TCP and PA has worked very well in a few years. And now we have a, a quick, that gives us another option for uh, transportation, that gives us an, other types of characteristics that may be used by HTTP or other protocols to continue to grow and to continue to evolve and to continue to create new needs. Of course, we need protocols that are flexible, that may meet the uses that uh, the requirements of the users we want for. It's not good to create protocols or to create needs that are unsolicited. They have to meet a real need. And not only does it have to be a technical problem, there must be incentives for an incremental use of uh, the protocol so that the more people use it, the more people will benefit. Open protocols, available codes, etc. Excellent. Thank you. Now let's go to a new round of questions. And now I ask you to be brief. I know that it would be wonderful to continue to discuss, but we'd like to give an opportunity to have at least two questions from the audience, uh, either here in the room or online. Are we going to have questions online? Yes. So you can write down your question. When we present ourselves in some government forums related to security, some uh, government representatives criticize the internet because of the lack of security. So the question would be for Christine, what are the current concerns of governments that you think that indeed are not being well addressed with the internet and all the security protocols that have been developed? Well, that's a complicated question, but I think that when we go to the forums, the greatest concerns, at least what people expressed were the governments are uh, um, uh, investigating crime and uh, espionage uh, and uh, uh, traffic uh, deviations, that is, uh, governments interfering with the communication of other governments. I think that the protocols are already there. What we need to give a reasonable response to most of the demands is already there. Of course, there will always be more and more demands, but we need to strike a balance between 
remaining flexible, that characteristic of uh, being a light and scalable network, um, a fast network. And I think that what our community is not doing is deploying those protocols. So I th think what's failing is the implementation of the protocols. To investigate a crime, we have to go back to the old uh, simplicity, having IPs for the devices, not uh, carry gray nets, complicating uh, research investigation and not having technology that make it difficult to, to investigate security issues. And RPKI with DNSSEC enables us to uh, give us the possibility to do a lot of things together with DLS and they give us a more secure internet, making it more difficult to hijack routes and downgrade attacks and communication. And I think that from our side, we still need to implement those policies and uh, ask the governments how to, uh, to have more security and investigate uh, the crime. Uh, the Netherlands is a good example. They know that uh, after an attack that very few in our region know that happened in 2012, Iran succeeded in compromising a certifying agency in uh, the Netherlands that and it stopped all the Dutch government to d conduct espionage of their citizens too. And then the government said, from now on, we want not, we don't want to suffer any more of those attacks. So th they deployed a TLSEC, a DNSSEC to enable technologies, including uh, so that we could uh, have the end-to-end -end certification with no downgrade and that you are talking with the people that you mean to talk to. So going back to the end-to-end -end principles of the internet, and I think that governments should understand and adopt those technologies because the governments themselves do not have the staff, uh, qualified staff. They lack uh, the networks implemented. But I think that the key protocols are already there as a community. We cannot. Uh, yield uh, uh, and have uh, be ready to have more control and uh, to pay that price for security. We have to do our job by training and having a more modern network, a more secure network, and adopting the protocols that are already there. But also showing the governments that the internet will not solve all the problems. If you have a problem with a platform, the, it's not an internet problem. If you have a problem with another government, the problem is not the internet. So I think that that will be a challenge in the 20 years to come of evangelizing and adopting the existing things. So that's what I view. Well, one of the processes of 5G is density. That is, if you are at the stadium, you can send the picture of uh, the goal and have connectivity. How? Does the 5G protocol benefit of uh, IP, for instance? Well, basically, as I said earlier, what the IP protocol enables you to do is to integrate invisibly for the user different types of devices with different uh, traffic density. And this is particularly important after the f fifth generation. It's also important to highlight what I said earlier that at least for those of us who come to the mobile world, 5G is the first network that is technologically heterogeneous. That is, that although it was conceived as a mobile network because of its architecture, it incorporates elements of the land networks. A 5G connection could have an and a, a landline or a Wi-Fi fixed uh, and and in the other end, a mobile um, and a, a wireless network. And this is important for field apps or that require you to move around or to develop um, quickly, for instance, in a car. So going to the concrete case that you mentioned, this is a key example, key example of complementarity. So 
uh, the stadiums, for instance, and the uh, subway stations or train stations that at certain times of the day or the week as in the stadium have a lot of traffic uh, sometimes. So having the flexibility for allocating resources is essential. And it is there that we have a convergence of the mobile technology that was created under that premise, that is, that the users are moving, and sometimes unpredictably so. Well, sometimes you can predict it, other times you can't. Uh, the use of elements of a, a fixed network where necessary, for instance, if we speak you may have read about some 5G apps that are industrial apps. In an industrial plant, if you already have fiber, you use the infrastructure and you leave the wireless technology to analyze, uh, to, to monitor an equip piece of equipment. For instance, I'm thinking of oil rigs where they are rigging, um, drilling uh, for a geologic uh, test uh, online or a car that is a vehicle that is operating in a civil engineering work and may be uh, uh, moved through uh, metaverse or digital tweet by an operator a remote operator and all that is thanks to the integration and that wouldn't be possible if we didn't have the mobile networks prepared to interact or from its architecture with a conception of protocol uh, internet protocols very good so over to ariel according to what christine said she said Simple decisions were made for the Internet in order to favor the different business models, applications, networks, technologies, organizations that even defined standards. That on one hand. On the other hand, regulations are made initially in the initial stages when technologies are just starting access to the Internet. Regulations arose back in the 90s where not even 500 million people were connected in the world. And in our region, not even 10%. But the regulations were already there. These regulations just selected one business model. They said, well, this is a business model that will work. 30 years later, we realize that there are things lacking in that model. So how can we, Ariel, accompany governments along this process and favor the development development of technologies, ava avoiding regulations or ex reg uh, expensive regulations or regulations at all. What can you tell us about that? Well, I find it amusing because avoiding regulations, well, we would love that, of course. Over the past 10 years, I used a phrase which was, you have to promote internet, not regulate internet. But I understand that there will be and there are regulations. Now, the problem I see in many countries is that regulators need that we, as ex technical experts, business people, provide more feedback in the sense of how this business changes so rapidly because regulation comes behind very often. They regulate just for the sake of regulating because they don't know how this works. So that is the danger this entails. Somehow, as part of this industry, we have the obligation of providing more training, of training the experts and telling and explaining this to the regulators, these business models that changed so rapidly, as well as I was explaining a while ago, the interaction and the use of content changes and changes the way in which traffic is distributed. They also regulations also change and in federal countries such as Argentina you have a federal government you have governments in the provinces and municipal governments so you have to have a dialogue at those levels and the possibility of persuading the three political 
levels so that the regulation that is put in place, for example, the use of the airspace or to do um, some works in the st along the streets and install fiber optics. This is an improvement for the localities. You are connecting one further town, community, to the internet, and this requires promotion and not regulation. So it's a two-way path. And as an industry, we still have to do a lot of work in terms of training and persuasion. Regulators have to understand that the business changes much faster than the pace at which they can provide regulations. Finally, Alvaro, what has been the role of IETF and other organizations that support standardization of networks and protocols over the past 50 years? IETF and other organizations are based on transparency, on consensus, and openness. These things are seen to a greater or lesser degree in these organizations. Now, this contributes to the collective development of the protocols. Anyone can participate. Anyone can propose solutions. borderless protocols with no commercial barriers. You have commercial organizations also collaborating to figure out solutions to a common problem. <coughs> we needn't be tied to local regulations. So these are global regulations. And this openness is very important. IETF and other organizations propose this kind of work. So we reach consensus after discussing these issues. You might be, uh, agree and highlight the virtues or lackings of different topics. And the other important part of this ecosystem is other standards that are produced are adopted voluntarily. They are collaborative in nature, but thinking of the network of networks, the networks can select different networks or processes. This once again opens the path to the development of new applications, to innovation, and contribute to the ongoing growth of the internet. Thank you, Alvaro. So now, we, if we have time for questions, Thank you very much. Oscar, yes, we have time for questions. Let's wait a couple of seconds so that you can ask your questions. Remember that you can go up to the microphones, mention your name, the organization you represent. Those who are following us remotely, remember that you can use a Q&A panel. As we have no questions yet. Oh, yes, we have one here in the room. Yes, go ahead, please. Good morning. I'm Raul Moreno. I'm from Brazil, and I'm representing Intel Technology. My question is for Mr. Grazer. You said that the networks have been designed for the coming five years. This increase in 35% resulting from the pandemic was a progress of how many years, according to your projections? as a minimum of one year, as a minimum. In our thought, this was about two years growth, because as I said, above 35%, a further increase took place up to 50%. So we had a shorter period. Within 15 days, we had the growth of a year or a year and a half or something like that. Thank you. Because this is a hybrid event, we're going to also see if we have remote questions. I'd like to invite Ignacio Estrada, Manager of Strategic Relations, so that he can help us with the remote questions. Nacho. 
Well, we have another question for Ariel from Israel Rosas from ISOC. Ariel spoke about the importance of maintaining com close communication with the regulators. Do you visualize that the NOGs could be a good vehicle to build those bridges, the NOGs, the NOGs as a vehicle to build such bridges? I believe, and although in Latin America, we have a similar kind of culture. Each country does the exercise in a different way somehow. So the way to approach the authorities locally will be different. They might help, yes. I believe in dialogue. I think it is necessary to build bridges. All the parallel bridges that could be built so that the regulator or the regulators understand the business in its in all its aspects from the technical standpoint from the commercial standpoint if they don't understand these two areas they will make the wrong decisions thank you we have an in person question yes go ahead good morning i'm julian la torre I graduated from the National University, and I'm speaking on that behalf, but also work with community networks at the, nor the northern part of the Cauca in Colombia. My question is the following. I was a bit concerned about what has been said. How can we speak about transparency in the development of the technical protocols of the Internet when, at the same time, we have seen for many years now, and this has been discussed too, on how limited the experience and human rationality regarding analyzing the context of each of the communities, of the specific communities that we have in the world. To give an example of what I mean, I'd like to mention the apps apps such as Uber. Initially, they make life easier when following principles that seem to be transparent and universal. But when applied in context of inequality, of a lack of symmetry and efficiency, are not really transparent in view of the national realities. And in the case of Uber, they end up definancing mobility and transport. Thank you. I'm going to ask Alvaro this question. We have to distinguish. Alvaro mentioned protocols, transparency in the definition of the protocols and not of the apps. The apps respond to specific interests. So, Alvaro, you have the floor. Yes, I was going to say that precisely. I did mention something along those lines in the sense that the use of apps and platforms, and as communities, as government, as regulators, we have problems. We have doubts regarding the operation of certain entities that provide internet services. These are not precisely through the internet. Internet facilitates the, the task. Like Oscar was saying, IETF and other organizations work on creating the internet infrastructure. These protocols are open and transparent in the development because they are used by everyone. Of, yes, if we speak about specific apps, this is quite a different topic. Obviously, these are developed by entities that have commercial and economic purposes. So this is a totally different topic. We have another question from someone in the room. Thank you. Lito Ibarra from ESINET and Raices from El Salvador. For anyone who wishes to make comments, we have spoken about issues related to the original design of the internet. We heard about 
efficiency and security, but we also have the issue of addressing for that purpose. We also have solutions as a community and IPv6, things that we have tried to promote for many years now and which we continue doing as a community. But in view of the reaction as a result of the pandemic, people asked, will the internet resist? It did, and it continues to do so. My question is, could this be a kind of a counter argument to continue without fully adopting IPv6 because people say, well, we overcame this. Why do we, what do we need IPv6 for? But of course, this is preaching to the choir. We wouldn't say no, but how can we counteract these potential uh, ideas? Who would like to comment on that? Well, Lito, let me tell you, in principle, IPv6 is the evolution. We have to demonstrate that we continue evolving over the past 50 years of development that we have had. We had many incidents, we had many situations, and of course, those of you who are dedicated to work on what the future brings work on these topics. So we're not proposing going back, we are proposing a path forward. So that is my position. I would like to add that it does work. I recall that an IGF, the search itself said that the problem of the internet is that worked very well. But I think now we have reached a stage in which part of the regulation that we have for the internet, and you know, this discussion on the regulations arises from the difficulties for implementing some security issues on um, criminal investigation and all that complexity so it can continue working is making things a bit more difficult. We might have regulations in place that might not be that bad if we would have a simpler type of internet with the adoption of the new protocols. I think that that is a topic that I wanted to repeat. That was my first comment. I think that today we should have, um, with uh, the generation that already uh, uh, was born with the Internet, uh, started the university with the Internet, and seeing it as a normal thing that it operates, maybe. It's, uh, it's completely different from my generation where Internet uh, was a new thing and each pr new protocol was uh, tested and we wanted the Internet to evolve. And I see that in the last 10 years, the people are sort of getting very cozy about it and uh, they just are ready to leave it as it is. I don't know how what we can do, but one of the incentives is to stop uh, recommendations a bit and uh, to improving the Internet even better uh, and not just having an internet that works and that's it. So I think that we need to see how we can incentivate. I don't know what the incentive could be, but I think that here we have brains that should uh, tell us how to reach that point. I don't have an answer. Well, yes, yeah, so well, well, we're going to have the last two questions. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Lisania Perez of the Technical Com Regional Committee of Telecommunications, and my question is as follows. So based on what the panelists said about promoting the Internet and not necessarily regulating it, if we uh, use the regulate, where the regulators had, what are the parameters that you can consider to regulate the uh, access and not the use? And if you don't regulate use, how can we approach the um, uh, wrongful uh, use of the cyberspace by cyber criminals. Would anybody like to answer? Well, I'd like to give a, uh, uh, to present a first proposal. It's not a response, but rather a proposal. Regulating access, in my view, I think that we should change that uh, and use the term universalizing access. That would be the way we can both promote and regulate at the same time. I think that that's the way, that's what, what we should do. Generations should help uh, to all of us to be connected, and that is what we mean by universalizing access. Now, I, I skip the uh, other part of the question. Well, let me 
I, I, I think that the I think that it, with crime, we all have to regulate everything, a chair, whatever, because crime can be made with anything. It's not through regulations that we're going to stop crime. We're going, we have crime everywhere, in society, on the street, in the internet. But we can make uh, the investigation of crime easier, and we can protect from those crimes. So I think that technical education and universalizing, not just the internet, but also not knowing how to use and how to protect, I think that that's a better solution than trying to regulate and prohibiting and controlling. Lisania, with regard to access, well, brains can uh, learn in uh, other people's houses. If you look at what happened in Brazil, where there are over 17,000 uh, access providers, you can discuss it with Basilio, the president of LACA XP, he's from Brazil, and how so many operators appeared in that country, and today they have a greater data capacity than the large operators. So they operate as distributors of access of large operators, and that business model is not uh, enabled in all the countries. It's not allowed. It would be very important for other countries to allow it. In Mexico, they recently approved the secondary use of the spectrum, for instance. That was not there initially. They didn't consider that the spectrum could have two different uses. Well, in Mexico, it was uh, achieved for some community networks, and I think that in Argentina, there are some examples of that kind. And even in Central America, you have the possibility today that uh, universities and the advanced networks of those universities may provide access, but the regulation does not allow them to. So regulation should understand those bis current business models. They should not compete against the operator because, of course, that would be a problem uh, having an impact on investment. But we have to understand the evolution of access to facilitate these new technologies. In Bhutan, they are building Wi-Fi networks with the TV white spaces. So there are many options, but you need to be open to avoid highly restrictive regulations focusing one single business model at very primitive stages of the development of technologies. Sorry, I think that I'm, I'm wearing the panelist's hat. Yes, let's continue with one more question, the last one uh, for the panel. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pessoa from Brazil. Now I'm beardless. It's a pleasure to greet you all, representing Spam House. The question is, well, for Christine, but actually for everyone, it's about the maturity of the community and the market on security issues. How do you see maturity, especially of the market, because as Oscar said, the IP markets, uh, either ISPs that are very small and uh, have seen a business model, and very often they don't have the resources that they would need to uh, do everything that you should have to do in the in the internet. So, how do you see maturity, and how can you see how can you work with security from the beginning and to help the smaller uh, business communities uh, to work on security, maybe jointly with other companies. Well, that would be enough for a panel. Uh, it's, it's a very broad topic. Let me summarize. I think that the greatest challenge is incentive, because what um, I, as a small provider, what I do is more to protect the internet from attacks leaving my network. Now, the provider needs to keep a clean house. That's a responsibility, but there are not too many incentives from an economic point of view, but it's under the attack of other 100 providers, for instance, in a case of denial of service. But in Brazil, we see some consultancy, uh, small companies of consultancy that are 
taking that uh, glove and understanding that by having a network that allows uh, fewer abuses, uh, that is open, that they detect botnets, and uh, that are planning to implement secure protocols, then the business will work better. Because I'm going to have to respond to uh, fewer uh, uh, incidents, and uh, I have less complaints, and I won't be attacked. Uh, and it's uh, maybe. People are not uh, mature enough yet, but we should think of it as a social responsibility. That is, I'm a provider, I have a network. I shouldn't generate any uh, pollution in the internet, so any garbage. That's something that we see in some places, people with that mentality. But it might be a business mentality, and then we would need somebody in the in the business world to see how we can sell that idea. I come from the security area, and I think that we need some marketing psychology and business psychology because it's it's bad for, for a business if my network is being blocked with uh, uh, emails that are, are attacking me. I need to have a better configured network and offering better services. So more stable, to provide stability. I don't know whether you want to complement it to have a st more stable network. These are the principles that we discussed at the beginning of flexibility, uh, stability, uh, uh, scalability, and res resilience. And we are at a time that as providers, we need a community uh, must think that we, our network cannot cause any instability in uh, the network. Maybe that should be the mentality. We're not there yet because the s small ISPs are tre still working at universalizing the internet, but those with a longer uh, life in the market are starting to think that uh, not generating attacks is better for business.